Shale maidens, female warriors of the Viking Age. Did they really exist or was it all a myth? What is to say that Lalga really did fight on the front lines and that the accounts that we saw in part one were not just fiction? Shale maidens have often been considered a phenomena only existing in the literary sources. Except that there is some evidence found in bones and artifacts dating to the Viking Age. But before we dig too deep into the ground looking for skeletons of past shield maidens, first we need to brush up on our legends. There are stories in the sagas and in Norse myth that relate to shield maidens without actually being about shield maidens. In Helga Kvilla Huningsbeiner, Helgi disguises himself as a woman. And when he's challenged on his manly looks, he says that it's because he used to be a female fighter wielding sword the Viking way. In Saxo stories, Hakbar also disguises himself as a shield maiden in order to meet Sine, the woman that he loves. And King Frodo the first disguised himself as a shield maiden in order to enter the camp of his enemy. Even if far from every woman was a warrior, the idea of shield maidens in the Norse lands was so widespread that if nothing else, when a man with a bit of a rugged look put on a dress and said that he used to be a female fighter, no one questioned him further. There's one more thing from mythology that we need to talk about. Let me tell you about our Lord and Savior. <coughs> I mean the Valkyries. The Valkyries were the choosers of the dead and they declared victory over battlefields. They were women who served drinks in Valhalla, the great hall of the afterlife. We find depictions of Valkyries all throughout the Viking Age through the artworks, like this tiny figurine of a woman holding a sword and a shield, which is called the Hopu Valkyrie. Or these beautiful brooches where a riding Valkyrie greets a non-riding Valkyrie. Or here on this runestone where a Valkyrie offers a drink to a warrior. In the old stories, Valkyries are repeatedly described as being able to ride through sea and air. They wear helmets, bloodstained chainmail, and shiny spears. Hold up! That's nothing like the Hopi Valkyrie. She's wearing a sword and a shield and she's not riding. I mean, I can see it with the brooches, but why is the Hopi figurine referred to as a Valkyrie and not as a female fighter? Honestly, it's just guesswork. It's a woman with a shield and a weapon. So if we can't find it in ourselves to call her shield maiden, then we're gonna have to go with Valkyrie. But let me challenge you further on this point. Does it even matter? The Viking Age is riddled with kennings, which are a form of riddles themselves. Kennings are used in poetic language to describe an object using different words. For example, a kenning for camel was desert ship, and a kenning for blood was battle sweat. One could argue that shale maiden was a kenning for Valkyrie. Imagine that you're an archaeologist and you have just discovered a Viking Age grave. How exciting! Now we need to figure out what kind of person was put to rest in this grave. Was it a man? Was it a woman? What was their status in society? What kind of job might they have had? How do we get the answers? There are two approaches depending on what we've actually found in the grave. The first is to rely on grave goods. Simply put, if there's jewelry, particularly oval brooches such as these, we're dealing with the grave of a woman. If there's weapons, it's a man. Pretty simple, right? Spindle, woman. Tongs and hammer, those are smithing tools, must be a man. Arm rings and necklaces, probably a woman. A comb? Ah, this is a trick question. Both men and women of the Viking Age cared about looking fabulous. These arguments don't always work. In the trading town of Bjerka, for example, weights are often found in graves. And from a traditional standpoint, a weight would indicate a male grave. But in Bjerka, 19% of the weights are found in female graves. On occasion, weapons and hunting equipment can be found in female graves from the Viking Age. At Kaupang, three separate cremation graves were discovered with oval brooches, which marked them as female, and also horse spit, sickle, axe, and other grave goods. Another grave at Kaupang, this one not a cremation, was a vast ship burial containing several bodies. The grave goods were associated with the closest skeleton, attributed to the skeleton of a young woman, where two oval brooches, a horse spit, an iron staff, an axe, and most interesting of all, a shield boss. It's often argued that these things didn't actually belong to the young woman since there were several bodies in the grave, but she was the person closest to the item. And let's also remember that hers was the skeleton found at the commander's spot, the stern of the ship. These were all unearthed in Kaupang. Excavations in that area started in 1867 and over 200 graves have been found and already excavated in the area, which is kind of a problem. Many Viking Age graves unearthed in the 19th and 20th century are poorly preserved if preserved at all. This is not just true in Kaupang, it's true everywhere. There's often a lack of documentations, no photos, no drawings, which makes it very difficult and sometimes even impossible 
to contextualize these findings today. Back then, graves were almost exclusively gendered on the basis of grave goods. And this means that some of them might have been misgendered because today, we don't just have to rely on grave goods. Another method is osteological analysis, examining the bones of the skeleton. Through a mixture of anthropological means and DNA tests and other tests, we can ascertain a lot about a skeleton. For example, their age, their gender, ails that might have inflicted their bones, like arthritis. This sounds reliable, right? And the impulse is to go back and re-examine everything that we found for the past two centuries. Not only would that be incredibly time-consuming and expensive, a lot of the time it's not possible at all. It might have been a cremation funeral. Think big, epic ship burial, or maybe just a pyre. Even when we do have viable bones to use, the results often come out inconclusive. Consider, for example, a female burial with an axe. It wasn't necessarily used for war, was it? Through osteological analysis, we can examine what kind of stress has been put on the bone. People who go to war and hack their axe or sword typically have arthritis in the shoulder, in the elbow, and in the wrist. This is called repetitive stress injuries. But here's the issue. People who use axes to chop wood usually have very similar repetitive stress injuries. So who's to say that one is a warrior and the other simply chopped wood? Perhaps an analysis of the axe itself might provide part of the answer looking specifically for any trace materials that might indicate its use, like wood or like iron residue from having climbed against other weapons. Yet even with those results, one question will always remain. Were the items in the grave actually used by the person who was buried there? Or were they gifts given by those who were still alive? Back in 1878, Jelma Stolpe excavated this magnificent grave in the old trading town of Bjerka. The grave was situated at a prominent spot close to the barricade, and the grave goods suggested that here lay a worthy warrior. The warrior was buried with a full set of gaming pieces, a sword, an axe, a spear, arrows, two shields, and two horses, one mare and one stallion. This was without a doubt a warrior, and to Stolpe and many others, clearly male. This grave continued to be upheld as an archetype of the ultimate Viking. And the warrior status of the grave was not questioned for many, many years until Anna Schellström noticed that the skeleton had rather large hips for a man. Upon closer inspection and a full osteological analysis, Anna Shellstrom concluded that the skeleton in grave BJ581 was a woman. Further tests revealed that the skeleton was indeed a woman, and also that the woman was over 30 years old, tall compared to most, and was not originally from the Birka area. The woman in grave BJ581 became known as the Birka Viking Warrior Woman. Q outrage. First, people claimed that a male must have been intended to be laying into the grave with the woman. But archaeologists said that the size of the grave and the way the grave goods were laid out made this highly unlikely. Besides, double burials in chamber graves are incredibly rare in Birka. Another theory was that the bones might have been mislabeled or switched around sometime in the last 150 years. Stolbe excavated over 1,100 graves from this area. Documentation back in the day was usually so poor that some graves and skeletons were completely misplaced. This was the case of the Mammon grave in Denmark, which is famous for this axe. The axe was originally discovered together with a skeleton, but for decades the skeleton was missing, until very recently when it was rediscovered and had been mislabeled. Thankfully, Stolpe, who was in charge of the BFA excavations, kept things in order. Stolpe was notorious for taking extensive notes and making drawings, but while excavating 1,100 graves, mistakes can happen. In 1963, more than 50 years after the initial excavations, out of the 1,162 excavations, only two skeletons were missing. That is remarkable for the time. The cranium is missing, but this is not as alarming as it might sound because it was standard practice back then to remove the cranium from the skeleton and place them into anatomical collections. The spinal condition of the skeleton in this grave are unique and they clearly match Stolpe's notes. Some people took this as a cue to argue that there was no combat damage 
found on the bones and therefore the skeleton could not possibly have been that of a warrior. However, we need to remember that the cranium is missing, there is no shoulder blade and also part of the pelvis is missing and this is usually where we would find that kind of damage. I must add at this point that male graves with similar finds are rarely ever questioned in this way. It's still a solid point. The facts remain that the individual was buried in a grave full of fully functional weapons and war gear and little else next to other graves with weapons next to a garrison. If the Birke find is not enough to prove the existence of Viking Age female warriors, then what are we actually looking for? If you look at the military today, then it quickly becomes clear there are many different roles to fill. Yes, of course, there are soldiers who need to fight on the front lines, but there are also commanders who stand back. There are people who need to cook and clean. There are people who work at the treasury, people who do the paperwork. And yes, in the Viking Age, the paperwork might have looked slightly different, but the same still stands. Everyone cannot fight on the front lines, certainly not at the same time. Today in the military, no matter where you're stationed though, you're likely going to have some form of combat training. In the Viking Age, not only were you likely going to have some combat training, you were likely also going to get deployed. And if you were going to get deployed in a ship, going to foreign shores, you were probably going to have to fight at some point as well. As a Viking warrior, you likely had to wear several hats, although none with horns. I'm serious, no horns. So what exactly defines a Viking warrior? Is it someone who goes and raids? Someone who fights? Does the term still apply if you're fighting to protect your own home? Or does it only apply if you're going abroad? Does a warrior have to fight in close combat? Is an archer not a warrior? And do you need to be injured in battle in order to qualify as a warrior? Do you have to die from taking an ax to the head? Or can you have died of natural causes too? What are the parameters that we are going to accept in order to apply the term Viking Age warrior and in turn the word shell maiden? I suppose the ideal situation to prove that Viking Age female warriors are real and don't just exist in the sagas and in the legends would be to find a woman buried with some kind of weapon that couldn't be used as an everyday tool, like a sword, and who also had battle injuries. That would be proof, right? Well, isn't it lucky then that we have exactly such an archaeological find? Let me introduce you to skeleton C22541, who I'm pretty sure is called Osla. You'll know why if you've seen part one. This is an incredibly rare and exciting discovery. Not only was the woman at Noah Kjölin found buried with an axe, also a sword. And a double-edged sword like this have no household function. They are weapons purely used for war. This grave was excavated over a hundred years ago and scientists back then also conducted osteological analysis on the skeleton. And they, like us today, concluded that the skeleton in this grave was indeed a woman. She was buried with a sword, an axe, a spear, five arrowheads, a horse, bridle and other tools. The shield bus was documented but disappeared during a fire in 1912. Thanks to a renewed interest in the topic of shield maidens, scientists are studying the skeleton to ascertain what kind of diet this woman might have had, what kind of disease history she might have had, what kind of injuries and much, much more. Already we know that the grave was from the 10th century. The woman was approximately 155 centimeters tall. She was between the ages of 18 and 19 and she had a head wound that might, might not have caused her death there is some evidence to healing on the skull. In year 1984, Pehernes did a re-evaluation of the find. He especially noted the short height of the woman and said that because of her short height, she could not possibly have been a warrior. And while I'm pretty cautious not to jump to conclusions because I'd rather be certain before I call someone a shield maiden, let me just get this one thing off my chest. If you get hit in the head by an ax, it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman holding the ax, you're going to be dead either way. And if you think she's too short to be able to reach your head, oh, you're going to be so surprised when she stabs you in the toe to make you fall and then slices your neck. Because the Vikings were known to fight dirty. In fact, ruses like that were celebrated. True Vikings fight with their wits as much as their strength. That being said, there are further analysis being done on the skeleton and I for one can't wait to see what kind of results we might get from this. If we can uncover not just one, but two or three graves like this, it starts to paint a picture that's much harder to argue against. With so many women today choosing the way of battle, it is so far-fetched to imagine that some women in the Viking Age, a time much more focused on military achievement, might choose to take up arms too. To me, as a Scandinavian, having grown up knowing so many strong women to rival those of the sagas, it's much more difficult to imagine that not a single one did. If you want to learn more about Vikings, it's up here 
and writing tips down here.